Rejoice aloud, all ye people. Let your hills and valleys ring with joy, for a Saviour who is mighty to save is born among you. Nor was this all the holy mirth, for the next word has also in it a fullness of joy. A Saviour who is Christ, or the Anointed. Our Lord is not an amateur Saviour who has come down from heaven upon an unauthorized mission, but he was chosen, ordained, and anointed of God. He could truly say, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me. Here is great comfort for all such as need a Saviour. It is to them no mean consolation that God has himself authorized Christ to save. There can be no fear of a jar between the mediator and the judge, no peril of a non-acceptance of our Saviour's work, because God has commissioned Christ to do what he has done, and in saving sinners he is only executing his Father's own will. Christ is here called the Anointed. All his people are anointed, and there were priests after the order of Aaron who were anointed, but he is the Anointed, anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, so plenteously anointed that, like the unction upon Aaron's head, the sacred anointing of the head of the church distills in copious streams, until we who are like the skirts of his garments are made sweet with the rich perfume. He is the anointed in a threefold sense, as prophet to preach the gospel with power, as priest to offer sacrifice, as king to rule and reign. In each of these he is preeminent. He is such a teacher, priest, and ruler as was never seen before. In him was a rare conjunction of glorious offices, for never did prophet, priest, and king meet in one person before among the sons of men, nor shall it ever be so again. Triple is the anointing of him who is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, a prophet like unto Moses, and a king of whose dominion there is no end. In the name of Christ the Holy Ghost is glorified by being seen as anointing the incarnate God. Truly, dear brethren, if we did but understand all this and receive it into our hearts, our souls would leap for joy on this Sabbath day to think that there is born unto us a Saviour who is anointed of the Lord. One more note, and this the loudest, let us sound it well and hear it well, which is Christ the Lord. Now the word Lord, or Curios, here used is tatamount to Jehovah. We cannot doubt that, because it is the same word used twice in the ninth verse, and in the ninth verse none can question that it means Jehovah. Hear it. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And if this be not enough, read the twenty-third verse. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Now the word Lord here assuredly refers to Jehovah, the one God, and so it must do here. Our Saviour is Christ, God, Jehovah. No testimony to his divinity could be plainer, it is indisputable. And what joy there is in this, for suppose an angel had been our Saviour, he would not have been able to bear the load of my sin or yours, or if anything less than God had been set up as the ground of our salvation, it might have been found too frail a foundation. But if he who undertakes to save is none other than the infinite and the almighty, then the load of our guilt can be carried upon such shoulders, the stupendous labor of our salvation can be achieved by such a worker, and that with ease. For all things are possible with God, and he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him. Ye sons of men, perceive ye here the subject of your joy. The God who made you, and against whom you have offended, has come down from heaven and taken upon himself your nature, that he might save you. He has come in the fullness of his glory, and the infinity of his mercy, that he might redeem you. Do you not welcome this news? What, will not your hearts be thankful for this? Does this matchless love awaken no gratitude? Were it not for this divine Saviour, your life here would have been wretchedness, and your future existence would have been endless woe. Oh, I pray you adore the incarnate God and trust in Him. Then will you bless the Lord for delivering you from the wrath to come, and as you lay hold of Jesus and find salvation in His name, you will tune your songs to His praise and exult with sacred joy. So much concerning this joy. 2. Follow me while I briefly speak of the people to whom this joy comes. Observe how the angel begins, 
Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, for unto you is born this day. So then the joy began with the first who heard it, the shepherds. To you, saith he, for unto you is born. Beloved hearer, shall the joy begin with you today? For it little avails you that Christ was born, or that Christ died, unless unto you a child is born, and for you Jesus bled. A personal interest is the main point. But I am poor, saith one. So were the shepherds. O ye poor, to you this mysterious child is born. The poor have the gospel preached unto them. He shall judge the poor and needy, and break in pieces the oppressor. But I am obscure and unknown, saith one. So were the watchers on the midnight plain. Who knew the men who endured hard toil, and kept their flocks by night? But you, unknown of men, are known to God. Shall it not be said, that unto you a child is born? The Lord regardeth not the greatness of men, but hath respect unto the lowly. But you are illiterate, you say, you cannot understand much. Be it so, but unto the shepherds Christ was born, and their simplicity did not hinder their receiving him, but even helped them to it. Be it so with yourself. Receive gladly the simple truth as it is in Jesus. The Lord hath exalted one chosen out of the people. No aristocratic Christ have I to preach to you, but the Saviour of the people, the friend of publicans and sinners. Jesus is the true poor man's friend. He is a covenant for the people, given to be a leader and a commander to the people. To you is Jesus given. O oh, that each heart might truly say, To me is Jesus born, for it I truly believe in Jesus, unto me Christ is born, and I may be as sure of it as if an angel announced it, since the scripture tells me that if I believe in Jesus, he is mine. After the angel had said, To you, he went on to say, It shall be to all people. But our translation is not accurate, the Greek is, And it shall be to all the people. This refers most assuredly to the Jewish nation. There can be no question about that. If any one looks at the original, he will not find so large and wide an expression as that given by our translators. It should be rendered, to all the people. And here let us speak a word for the Jews. How long and how sinfully has the Christian church despised the most honorable amongst the nations? How barbarously has Israel been handled by the so-called church? I felt my spirit burn indignantly within me in Rome when I stood in the Jews' quarter and heard of the cruel indignities which popery has heaped upon the Jews even until recently. At this hour there stands in the Jews' quarter a church built right in front of the entrance to it, and into this the unhappy Jews were driven forcibly on certain occasions. To this church they were compelled to subscribe, Subscribe, mark you, as worshippers of the one invisible God, to the support of a system which is leprous with idolatry, as were the Canaanites whom the Lord abhorred. Paganism is not more degrading than Romanism. Over the door of this church is placed, in their own tongue in the Hebrew, these words, All day long have I stretched out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying generation. How, by such an insult as that, could they hope to convert the Jew? The Jew saw everywhere idols which his soul abhorred, and he loathed the name of Christ, because he associated it with idol worship, and I do not wonder that he did. I praise the Jew that he could not give up his own simple theism and worship of the true God for such a base, degrading superstition as that which Rome presented to him. Instead of thinking it a wonder of unbelief that the Jew is not a Christian, I honor him for his faith and his courageous resistance of a fascinating heathenism. If Romanism be Christianity, I am not, neither could I be, a Christian. It were a more manly thing to be a simple believer in one God, or even an honest doubter upon all religion, than worship such crowds of gods and goddesses as Popery has set up, and to bow as she does before rotten bones and dead men's winding sheets. Let the true Christian church think lovingly of the Jew, and with respectful earnestness tell him the true gospel. Let her sweep away superstition, and set before him the one gracious God in the trinity of his divine unity. And the day shall yet come when the Jews, who were the first apostles to the Gentiles, the first missionaries to us who were afar off, shall be gathered in again. 
Until that shall be, the fullness of the church's glory can never come. Matchless benefits to the world are bound up with the restoration of Israel. Their gathering in shall be as life from the dead. Jesus the Saviour is the joy of all nations, but let not the chosen race be denied their peculiar share of whatever promise Holy Writ has recorded with a special view to them. The woes which their sins brought upon them have fallen thick and heavily, and even so let the richest blessings distill upon them. Although our translation is not literally correct, it nevertheless expresses a great truth, taught plainly in the context, and therefore we will advance another step. The coming of Christ is a joy to all people. It is so, for the fourteenth verse says, on earth peace, which is a wide and even unlimited expression. It adds, good will towards, not Jews, but men, all men. The word is the generic name of the entire race, and there is no doubt that the coming of Christ does bring joy to all sorts of people. It brings a measure of joy even to those who are not Christians. Christ does not bless them in the highest and truest sense, but the influence of his teaching imparts benefits of an inferior sort, such as they are capable of receiving. For wherever the gospel is proclaimed, it is no small blessing to all the population." Note this fact, there is no land beneath the sun where there is an open Bible and a preached gospel where a tyrant long can hold his place. It matters not who he be, whether pope or king. Let the pulpit be used properly for the preaching of Christ crucified, let the Bible be opened to be read by all men, and no tyrant can long rule in peace. England owes her freedom to the Bible, and France will never possess liberty, lasting and well established, till she comes to reverence the gospel, which too long she has rejected. There is joy to all mankind where Christ comes. The religion of Jesus makes men think, and to make men think is always dangerous to a despot's power. The religion of Jesus Christ sets a man free from superstition. When he believes in Jesus, what cares he for papal excommunications, or whether priests give or withhold their absolution? The man no longer cringes and bows down. He is no more willing, like a beast, to be led by the nose. But, learning to think for himself and becoming a man, he disdains the childish fears which once held him in slavery. Hence, where Jesus comes, even if men do not receive him as the Saviour, and so miss the fullest joy, yet they get a measure of benefit. And I pray God that everywhere his gospel may be so proclaimed, and that so many may be actuated by the spirit of it, that it may be better for all mankind. If men receive Christ, there will be no more oppression. The true Christian does to others as he would that they should do to him, and there is no more contention of classes, nor grinding of the faces of the poor. Slavery must go down where Christianity rules, and mark you, if Romanism be once destroyed, and pure Christianity shall govern all nations, war itself must come to an end. For if there be anything which this book denounces and counts the hugest of all crimes, it is the crime of war. Put up thy sword into thy sheath, for hath not he said, Thou shalt not kill, and he meant not that it was a sin to kill one, but a glory to kill a million, but he meant that bloodshed on the smallest or largest scale was sinful. Let Christ govern, and men shall break the bow, and cut the spear in sunder, and burn the chariot in the fire. It is joy to all nations that Christ is born, the Prince of Peace, the King who rules in righteousness. But, beloved, the greatest joy is to those who know Christ as a Saviour. Here the song rises to a higher and sublimer note. Unto us indeed a child is born, if we can say that he is our Saviour who is Christ the Lord. Let me ask each of you a few personal questions. Are your sins forgiven you for his name's sake? Is the head of the serpent bruised in your soul? Does the seed of the woman reign in sanctifying power over your nature? Oh, then, you have the joy that is to all the people in the truest form of it. And, dear brother, dear sister, the further you submit yourself to Christ the Lord, the more completely you know him and are like him, the fuller will your happiness become. Surface joy is to those who live where the Saviour is preached. But the great deeps, the great fathomless deeps of solemn joy, which glisten and sparkle with delight, are for such as know the Saviour, obey the Anointed One, and have communion with the Lord Himself.